Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our class. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come uh, entering your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, just mindful of the fact that you have brought us to this place today, set your word before us so that we might learn, grow, mature, help one another, encourage one another, and strengthen one another. May our meeting uh, this morning be one that, is, uh, that bears such fruit, that strengthens, and that uh, strengthens our resolve to, to go into the world and truly convert uh, many, many to your understanding, to your pathway, to the salvation that uh, you offer, to an understanding of your, your son, to the blessedness uh, of living a life uh, that dedicates uh, itself to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, for those, thank you for those who are here this morning, those especially that have taken on the, uh, the role of uh, opening your word and, and teaching it and just blessing the lives of those about uh, them with it. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for our, our leadership here, just uh, the direction uh, they, they uh, take us and the wonderful work they, they do among us. Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, you bless those of our number who at this time have been afflicted with illness, difficulty, and struggles. Struggles and difficulty that keep them away and, and apart from the, the body. Give us a uh, time and a chance to, to uh, encourage them and strengthen them beyond this one that we have this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you uh, most of all for your son who had died upon a cross, who went there willingly, suffered much, so that we can have an eternity with you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. This morning we are finishing up with uh, the conversion of Saul. We're going to ask just a few questions about it, have a little discussion. Uh, or Saul, I should say. And then uh, we're going to move on to the next case, uh, which is in Acts chapter uh, 10. Uh, there's a lot of information there on, on Saul, uh, and you can read through it. And as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of that, uh, aside from some additions that uh, I've made, uh, is, uh, was... Um, uh, the product uh, of Brother Wayne Jackson uh, of the Christian Courier. Uh, so we can read through that uh, and uh, kind of take all that information in. Uh, but we, we do want to <clears throat> make sure that we're touching all of the things that we need to know and understand about, you know, Saul's conversion. In each and every case, I, I think that we've uh, ta been able to take something from uh, the particular, you know, cases that are mentioned. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, what, what God intended for us to do. Uh, if every case was, you know, generic so-and-so taught generic so-and-so, and it was always the same lesson in the same place uh, at the same time, then uh, I'm not so sure that we would learn too much, you know, from that. But as diverse a, as we are as human beings, uh, as far as, uh, well, I mean, just pick something. Uh, I mean, the people you're going to find converted uh, are going to be people of, of different uh, nationalities, they're going to be of different backgrounds, they're going to be uh, from different uh, economic uh, conditions, different statuses, uh, different professions, uh, and uh, different people, of, of course, uh, almost as individual as they are, are going to receive, uh, are going to receive uh, you know, the Word of God differently. Uh, and <clears throat> we go through these uh, conversions account, and one of the, the primary things that I think that we're supposed to learn, uh, especially, uh, is uh, conditioned upon the actual account uh, I itself. Uh, you know, for instance, if you go back to, to the book of Acts in chapter 2, uh, it, it is kind of that opening salvo of salvation, right? Uh, it, it is the, uh, you know, all-encompassing uh, sort of benchmark that, that we encounter um, when it comes to what does it mean to be converted? We're talking about a group of people uh, there on, on Pentecost, a multitude of them, many of uh, which were, were probably uh, witnesses to the actual crucifixion and perhaps even stood in the mobs and said, crucify him. Uh, the apostles stand up, the power of the Spirit comes, 
Uh, and in that uh, power, uh, them speaking in tongues in a miraculous way, uh, they proclaim that, uh, that wonderful message. Well, what is the message? Well, essentially, it is the death and burial and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. You, you've killed him, uh, just like we've killed him with uh, our sins, uh, because he went to the cross to take away our sins, to bear those things, uh, and, and to take them out of, uh, you know, the, the way as we embrace uh, you know, salvation. Uh, they ask the question, what must we do? Uh, and they're given the answer. Uh, they're given the answer. They are convicted. Uh, they are convicted by the message. So in other words, they, they hear the truth. Uh, they believe that truth. Uh, it pricks their, their hearts, uh, which uh, very simply is just another way of, uh, of putting, um, you know, they've changed their, their minds uh, about the way they looked at this Jesus, uh, the way that they looked at what they did uh, and now they're asking, what can we do? Uh, and they're given an answer. Repent and be baptized. Uh, and uh, they are given two promises. Uh, remission of sins, and they'll receive the gift uh, of the Holy uh, Spirit. Uh, so th this is a kind of large case uh, scenario where we have the central features uh, of the gospel being, being taught to a large group of people who prior to this point... Um, not all of them, but certainly uh, some of them there uh, were caustic towards Christ uh, and those who would, you know, follow him. And we see a complete turnaround. Uh, we see thousands of people being con converted. Uh, and then we move forward. And from each of the cases, we take something a little bit, you know, different. Uh, I think Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, we take from that uh, the idea that, you know, God is, is sending people in, you know, to places that you know, perhaps we would be reluctant to look to, to win souls. I mean, they were on an abandoned road um, that, you, you know, passed through a place that was, you know, desolate. He sends Philip there, and, and by that, no doubt, the, the gospel is going to be taken from one nation to an entirely different nation by a man who has, you know, the power to, to do it. Uh, you look at Simon the, the sorcerer, and of course, Simon's uh, big story is that uh, he is converted, but seems to slip back rather quickly. Uh, and of course, uh, I think one of the great messages of, of the conversion stories is that just because you're converted doesn't mean you can't fall. It, you know, doesn't mean that you're, you know, in the safety and always in the safety and nothing can remove you from, you know, the, the love of God. You can. Uh, you can remove you uh, from, you know, the love of God. Uh, so uh, you can go through each case and, and you can look at it. So what are we supposed to learn from Saul's conversion? You know, I know there are many, many different lessons. But if you were going to pick one lesson that stands out as the ultimate lesson um, concerning Saul, what would it be? What would it be? Now, yours doesn't have to be the same as mine. Uh, the story is told three different times. There's a lot of different facts um, and in each one of the cases, I think something different is emphasized. Uh, so, you know, we can have multiple answers here, certainly. Yes? Okay, convicted, convinced. You can be convinced that something is true. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's, that it's true. Uh, but you, are, are you talking about the Thessalonians? No, 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 the Macedonians. The Bereans. Is that the one? Okay, the Bereans. Yeah, yeah, okay. The Macedonians were the ones that gave themselves first. Yeah, okay. They were, yeah. That's right, the Bereans. Okay, yeah, very good. Uh, I look at it too like, you know, if Paul could be converted, anyone who wants to give their life to Christ can be converted. Okay. I mean, you can be the worst person in the world, but if God talks to her, you talk to him and decide that's what you want to do, you'll change your life. Okay, if you didn't hear Ralph, he said, uh, if Saul can be converted, then anybody can be converted. Uh, and um, in many ways, that's true. What makes that, what, what makes that a point that's, that's a powerful point? What makes that, you know, an accurate statement? 
Well, number one, he was what? What did he do? Killed his people. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in, in the very least, we can just kind of throw out that broad umbrella of he persecuted the church. Uh, you, you know, by God's own estimation, by Jesus' own estimation, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, you, you know, he was a persecutor of God's people, uh, of God's people, uh, to the point where, and we have certain details, we know that he stood by and, uh, you, you know, kind of held the coats or they were laid at his feet when, when Stephen uh, was, was killed. We know that he went so far as to get letters from, uh, you know, um, get letters from uh, the Jewish leaders uh, to be able to go and, and find Christians uh, and drag them before, you, you know, the council, go into their homes, uh, you, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, um, oh man, just flew right out of my head. Uh, but anyhow, like, you, you know, like, a, like an assault group, uh, you going into somebody's home, knocking down doors, pulling people out. Uh, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's what he did. And, you know, Paul doesn't uh, let go of that later on. You know, he, even late in his ministry, he, you know, he talks about uh, how he is the, the chief of all sinners because he persecuted um, the, the church. Okay, why else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a great book um, that is written by this. I, I want to say it's William Barclay, but I, I'm, for some reason that, that's not hitting me right. Uh, but uh, the book is called Paul, From uh, Persecutor to Persecuted. Uh, and uh, it, it brings out, it's a very interesting book, but it, it brings that out, how Paul, uh, you know, went from the one who was, you know, destroying and persecuting the church to he himself um, of all of the people in the New Testament, um, seems to be the most persecuted. You know, now part of that is simply due to his longevity. You know, I mean, Stephen, well, you, you know, all we know is the one incident, but it took his life, you know, so we don't know that much more. But as far as the, the biblical narrative goes, the New Testament details more, uh, you know, persecution of, of this persecutor uh, than anybody else uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, so, yeah, it's a pretty radical thing. Now, in, in all of that, you know, what was it about Saul that didn't change? His dedication to God. Yeah, he was always dedicated to God, right? You know, Paul himself would say, you know, I, I've done all things in what? Good conscience. You, you know, his, his intention was always right. You know, he wanted to, to serve God, and he did it with zeal, uh, with fervor, and with, with passion. Uh, it was just simply misdirected, uh, uneducated, uninformed. Uh, and, um, you know, but when he was told the truth, uh, you, you got to give it to Paul. And this is, to me, one of the big takeaways. Here's a guy who, I mean, you'd think if anybody were going to be in that, you know, rut that was unmovable, unshakable, um, kind of blinders on, moving forward, it, it was Saul. Um, and, and he, he has this, uh, you know, incident on the road to Damascus. He, he goes to Ananias, and Ananias teaches him, and he immediately embraces it. You know, now it's always his choice. He could have said, you know what, I think this whole thing is a trick. You know, this is just another ploy and plan by this heresy to attack me and the good work that I'm doing. Uh, and he could have rejected it all. Uh, and, and said, no, I'm, I'm going to continue. Uh, but he didn't. He embraced it uh, and said, I'm wrong. Uh, you know, and, I, and I need to, to you know, change and move. Uh, so 
Yeah, very good. Awesome. Ralph? And, and I think that's one of the problems in, in the world. I mean, uh, a lot of people, um, including myself, was raised in, you know, denominational religion, and we believed what we were taught. And if you grow up believing something, and then all of a sudden somebody starts telling you it's wrong, well, when they start proving it in the Bible, and you believe the Bible, then you got to change. And so that's what I see in Paul also. He thought what he was doing was right. And, and a lot of these people think what they're doing is right also. I mean, they just don't know the difference, and neither did we. Neither did I. Yeah. Well, it's a human tendency, I think. Yeah. And, and that's why I say, you know, if, if ever there was a guy who, you know, had that, uh, you know, sort of in the rut blind mentality, it would have been him. Because not only did he have a belief, see, a lot of people believe stuff in the sense that they understand a certain set of facts and they think they're true. Um, add to that the idea that not only do I believe, but I believe that, you know, they're they're true and they're true to the point at which I must take action and then they actually act on it uh, and have for years. Uh, each one of those steps is a step further away from the idea that you know this person can change their mind because it's not just a product of what you think it's now a product, a product of how you feel uh, and your actions and your will. Um, so, you know, the more involved areas uh, of, you know, our mind and our, and our body, the less likely I think we are to kind of give those things up easily. Uh, and, and Paul was totally committed, uh, thus by his action. But, you know, he, uh, you know, he, he did, he, he changed. Another thing, too, uh, I never heard of the Church of Christ until I came to Paul. And I never heard of it until I was introduced to it. I didn't know it was different than anything else. I had, I had no idea what it was until I went to a Bible study. Yeah. And then after listening and deciding, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my mind. Okay. Very good. So you got to know it or you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Lori? Oh, it is. And I think part of the inspiration for us in the story is that there's, there's this complete turnaround in every aspect, um, you know, aside from that root of intention. Um, he, you know, Paul or Saul, you know, he's going one direction and he's doing it with everything he's got. He learns the truth, and, and he simply turns and goes in the other direction with everything he's got. You know, you look at Saul before and Saul after. With the same zeal that he persecuted the church, he built churches. You know, with the same, you know, zeal the, with which he drug people out of their homes, he taught people about salvation. You know, I mean, it's just uh, Paul's uh, his story is a story of uh, zeal and fervor and energy and, and just, uh, you know, constant uh, teaching and, and provoking and uh, building up the saints uh, and it's just uh, it is it's a very inspirational story all right anyone else yes okay Okay. 
Yeah, and, and I think in all the cases of conversion, it, it, uh, it emphasizes this. And again, I think it emphasizes it um, not as more important than any other idea uh, in salvation, but the pivotal point uh, at which we, you know, commit, um, you know, because, and, and again, I know we've said it multiple times, baptism is, a, the, is the point at which you become passive. Uh, it, it is the point at which you let him have his way with thee, to quote the old song, right? Um, you, you know, if, you, if you're going to pick up his word and read, you're going to do that. If you're going to try to understand it, you're going to do that. If you're going to, you know, have a faith, then it's going to be built upon hearing that word. If you're, you know, if your heart is going to be touched, if you're going to be changed, uh, then certainly that comes from external, you know, influence, but that's on you too. You know, the, the confession that, that you make uh, with the lips unto salvation, as Paul talks about in Romans 10, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be on you too. Uh, but baptism is the point at which you say, all right, I'm letting you have your way. Uh, it's me giving myself to you. You know, Paul later on would, would, you know, write those famous words, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Uh, and, uh, you know, that giving away of, of self and that getting into Christ, according to Paul in, in Galatians, um, is the product of baptism, uh, that burial uh, and subsequent resurrection uh, that we have, you know, by it. Uh, so, you know, each one of the accounts uh, in the book of Acts of conversion does emphasize, you know, baptism. Uh, just like it emphasizes hearing, you know, God's word. And, and Paul's story does that as well. A um, little different here. Uh, but it says, you know, rise and wash away your sins. Um, but there's a good discussion of that in the notes. Uh, you, you know, it's a, kind of a middle voice type of thing where it's something that is done, you know, to you um, with the positive re results moving into the future. But anyhow, yeah, very good. Anyone else about Paul? Saul. Yes. I think that shows that God didn't give up on Saul, and I don't think he gives up on any of us. He just keeps prodding, and, and uh, he can see what you can do and kind of pushes you to do the right thing. Yeah, and, and those are really, really key points, I think. Um, if you didn't hear Ms. Vivian, she said that uh, God doesn't give up. Uh, on people, but, you know, he sees what we can do uh, and moves us uh, in, in that direction if we're willing to see it, right? You know, I mean, uh, God obviously saw, Jesus obviously saw that, you know, Paul could be a great force, you know, for the kingdom. As a matter of fact, that's what he's told uh, in, in his conversion account. You know, this is what you're going to do. You know, this is the mission I have for you. Now, sometimes... Wouldn't it be nice if someone came and told you what your mission was? Wouldn't it be cool if one day you got a letter from God saying, hey, this is what you're really supposed to be doing? You know, because sometimes it's, it's not easy to figure out. What am I talented in? What, what can I do? Uh, and, you, you know, seemingly that, that can be kind of a difficult thing for us. Um, and I think it's difficult on purpose. Um, partly to, to get us, you know... Uh, active and moving and, and uh, explore the idea of not only us, but God and his work and um, just do, you know, what we can. But uh, I think uh, the, the basic sentiment is, is, is accurate and um, pertinent, uh, you know, to, to Saul and his conversion. God doesn't give up, uh, but uh, he will move us uh, in the direction where we can be used um, in the kingdom. Any other lessons that stand out for you about Saul? Okay, yes. Paul was often brave to, and he trusted God to protect him, to go back into these places where people knew what he was and what he was doing, and he's going against what his religion was. Yeah. And he ends up going back and talking to them, doesn't he? You know, um, telling them, you know, you are my kinsmen. You are, you are my, my brethren. Uh, of course, he's speaking uh, about, you know, being Jewish. And, 
he, he tries to teach them, uh, tries to teach them. Uh, and eventually he reaches this point where uh, his word among the Jewish people is, is just not taken. And he says uh, that he's kind of wiped his hands clean. Uh, and he's moving on to, to the Gentile world. Uh, of course, God, you know, tells him that's your mission, and that's what he was going to, to do anyhow, but, um, you know, it, it was a very, you know, brave or courageous thing to do, to go back to um, the people who were in the same boat as you were in. You know, he was convicted that what he was pursuing was, was off base. It, it, was, it was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So he goes back to those same people that are in that same boat. You know, he, he doesn't want them to, to remain there. Uh, so, yeah, very good. Anyone else? Yes, Bunny. In a way, that's what I don't understand a lot of things, but in a way, didn't Jesus show us that the Jews were the Well, um, well, yeah, I mean, certainly the example for all of us. I mean, Christ, uh, you know, talked to, to, to everyone that, that we know of, um, of various nationalities during the course of his ministry. I mean, you have the incident with the woman at the well. You have him talking to rich people, poor people, um, people who would claim to be moral, people who were immoral, obviously so. Uh, and, you know, you have a wide range of people. Primarily, he taught among those who were downtrodden and um, distressed. Uh, but uh, as far as nationality goes, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Great Commission, he leaves us, you know, go into the world. Uh, go to every creature. Uh, it's certainly going to be the marching orders for each and all of us. Uh, you know, so yes, he, he would be that uh, example to, you know, follow. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Saul? Okay, just a couple of things that linger, and then we're going to go at least uh, read uh, the next uh, account. Um, why do you think that uh, Ananias was reluctant to go, and what changed his mind? Thought he was going to be killed? Yeah, but you know, why would God come to you and tell you, go face this killer because you might be killed? Well, he didn't tell him that, right? No, he said, go. And, and of course, Ananias says, look, hey, you know, I know this guy. I've heard of him, and, and he, he's reluctant. You know, he's reluctant, and it has everything to do with who you know, Saul is. Um, so why does he end up going? Because God told him to, and he believed. I mean, he was a believer. Jesus said, he is my chosen vessel. To go be a witness. Okay, yeah, he says, he's my chosen vessel. He's going to go, and he's going to be a witness, uh, you know, for me. And, of course, Ananias here um, has a trust. You know, and, and I, I like this point, and I always like to bring it out, because, you know, he is. Saul is a, is a guy who breathing out threats. He's dragging people away, and everybody seems to know who, who he is. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of like the guy in your town that has the worst reputation, and someone comes up and says, hey, well, let's go talk to that guy. You know, you're like, what? You know, um, Ananias' faith was greater uh, than any fear he had uh, of Saul. It, that's what it comes down to. Uh, his faith in God was greater than any other influence in his life, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, just a, a fear or whether it be, you know, some other uh, thing. Uh, his faith in God uh, was, was greater. Uh, and, you know, Ananias seems to play a bit part here, but not really. Uh, I mean, that's, you're, you're talking about a great faith. And the more you study it and the more you understand Saul, 
uh, the, the, greater, the greater the faith of Ananias seems to, uh, you know, seems to be. Now, he questions, but I think that's important too. You know, does God ever disapprove of us asking questions? Well, no. I mean, Thomas wanted to see the, the marks, right? Paul himself would light, later, write, later write in 1 Thessalonians, prove all things. You know, test the spirits, John would write. Uh, so, you know, God, uh, I don't think, <laughs> minds us asking questions. Uh, he, you know, it's perfectly fine for us to ask, okay, why? Uh, when, but when we give an answer, God expects us to go. God expects us to move. He expects us to, to do. Now, bringing this kind of into the, you know, our setting, you know, do we sometimes have a reluctance in, in our thinking uh, about certain people or groups of people? Um, and I think Brother Wayne kind of touched on this. You know, who is it in our mind that we've convinced ourselves is unreachable? You know, is outside that salvation of, you know, God. Um, because, I mean, look at what hangs in the balance here. You know, Ananias says, I've heard about this guy. In, in reality, uh, the, the question is one of life or death. You know, is, is Saul going to get taught the truth or not? If he's not, never taught the truth, then he's not going to come to truth. And if he doesn't come to truth, he's not going to have the salvation of God. Uh, so it's a question of life or death. But it's no less not life or death than it is today. Uh, so, you know, do we have people that are, you know, unreachable? You know, the guy who builds a, an explosive device uh, in his basement and, you know, puts it on a, on a roadside and yells out, Alu Akbar, I mean, is that guy, is he unreachable? You know, uh, I mean, who's unreachable? This is what we're talking about here, uh, about uh, Ananias' trepidation here. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I see the lesson of Abraham because God told Abraham to leave and go to a place I'm going to show you. And Abraham didn't question him. He just left. He was up left. And we're, brought, we're taught this in Hebrews 11. So we know that there wasn't any question. Abraham just up the left on a whim because God told him to leave. And here Ananias has come trying to come up with excuses. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, uh, we always try to come up with excuses. Well, I don't know about this, but I kind of do. I kind of go over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes we need to embrace level of faith that Abraham had. Yeah. When God tells us to do something, just do it. Yeah, and that's true. Um, but, it, you know, if, if Ananias, if we were never told about Ananias making an excuse, um, it might seem odd to us. You know, I mean, this is one of those parts that makes the Bible the, uh, the, the wonderful book that it is and the divinely inspired book that it is. It, you know, God uh, pulls no punches. He has no problem telling you uh, that, you know, there was questioning. Uh, go back to Moses. There was excuses, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and, and to us, sometimes those seem to be detrimental. I think they're less so than, than perhaps we often think they are. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think you're right. Yeah. But anyhow, I mean, you know, we have the same mission today where we're told... You know, we need to go, and, and the answer to the question is no one. Uh, every creature, all mankind, uh, everyone, when we have opportunity and, and we have uh, the ability, um, you know, we, we should be trying to influence them in, in godly ways uh, and for Christ and, and teaching them about, uh, you know, uh, Jesus. Uh, you know, if Paul or Saul is, was reachable, then, you know, who are, who are we not? Uh, who are we to, to say some uh, are not? Yeah, very good. All right, uh, let's go on. Uh, this, that was just kind of the, the last few things that we had. Let, let's turn over to Acts chapter 10 and move on to the next case of conversion. If you have the notes, you should have this uh, uh, next in the notes. Uh, of course, this is the, uh, this is the uh, case uh, of uh, Cornelius, the conversion story of uh, Cornelius. Uh, interesting story. Uh, it's a little bit longer story than some of the ones that uh, we read about and certainly some of the ones that will come after. But let's go ahead and do a little bit of reading. Beginning with verse uh, 1. 
At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he, st <clears throat> and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alm alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up uh, on the, the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds uh, of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice uh, came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called to ask out whether Simon, was called, uh, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter uh, went down to, to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send uh, for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guest. The next day he arose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his uh, relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when, I, <clears throat> so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house. At the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent uh, to Israel, preaching good news uh, of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. <clears throat> he went about doing good and healing all who were uh, oppressed by the devil, for God uh, was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the, in the country of the Jews and uh, in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and made him to appear, to not, to, to all not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God, to be judge of the living and the dead. 
To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the, the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them, <clears throat> hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. All right, so we read the whole chapter. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the story uh, of Cornelius. But let's begin with Cornelius the man. I and mean, I know we only got a couple uh, of moments. But we want to begin with uh, Cornelius the, the man and kind of figure out who uh, he is. So what does it tell us about Cornelius? What does it tell us about him? Okay, he's a Roman soldier. Okay, and uh, we, we don't know a whole lot about this uh, you know, Italian cohort. Uh, but we do know that uh, he's not only a Roman soldier, but he is a leader. Uh, as, a, as a Roman soldier. What else do we know about him? He was, devout. he was a devout man, right? Devout. What does it mean to be devout? Is that like, you know, he took some vow of some kind? I mean, you know. He was dedicated, he was dedicated right? Right. Right. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a leader in, uh, he's, a, he's a leader among the, the Romans, uh, over men, giving them orders, telling them, uh, you know, what to do, how to act, uh, you know, all of that. Um, you know, we assume then that uh, he is either Roman or, uh, in the very least, he, he's not uh, Jewish. Uh, he's not Jewish. Uh, he's a devout man. Uh, he's a man of prayer, and he's a man that gives great alms. And then later in the text, when the story is kind of being retold about who he is, one other thing is said that's very, very interesting, uh, is that he is well respected uh, and liked among the Jewish people. Um, so, you know, most people didn't like the Romans. Most of the Jews didn't like the Romans or the soldiers. Uh, so th this guy's a standout guy. He, he's, he's different. Uh, he's different. Uh, and we run across, the, across a couple of, of these leaders in Rome uh, that, that are like that. Um, some in the case, some in the ministry of Christ, but certainly uh, here. But um, it's definitely something different about Cornelius. So we'll pick up there next time uh, and we'll move forward uh, in, in the case of Cornelius. Uh, again, read through chapter 10, kind of make your own notes and observations, uh, and we'll come back next time prepared to, to talk about it. Appreciate everybody's input. Once again, good morning. Going to be with you this morning. Uh, the first place we're going to be turning to in the Bible is going to be in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, if you want to go ahead and start turning there. You're only going to be going to three different places uh, in the Scripture this morning as we begin to consider our great and awesome God. And this morning, consider Him as our Creator. The Bible begins that way. In the beginning, God created and it behooves us then, as we start talking about our great and awesome God, that we begin at the beginning. While you're turning there, however, I do want to uh, make one note, of, uh, an announcement type. Uh, make sure that you plan on sticking uh, with us a little bit after. We are having a potluck today. Uh, it is fitting on this first uh, Sunday of 2018 uh, that we uh, share some food, some fellowship, uh, enjoy one another's company, uh, and that's what we plan on doing today immediately following our services. If you're visiting with us, don't feel like you need to have brought something, uh, but just come, uh, join us, uh, and um, anyone here can tell you where it is, uh, just kind of out this door to the right and on back, but uh, um, make sure that you plan on sticking around. Everyone's invited, uh, and I'm sure we will have a great and wonderful time. Our God, indeed, is an awesome God. 
Uh, Our God indeed reigns from heaven above. And those heavens are an amazing thing. When we consider what God has told us and who he is as a person, it behooves us to kind of start with what we experience each and every day. Most people are kind of that way. You can tell them something, you can encourage them to read a book, but they may not do it. They, however, will indeed live each and every day. And if they take but a moment's time to contemplate the world around them, and they do so honestly, looking at the larger issues behind the things and the people and the stuff that they will encounter each and every day, then no doubt they will come to the same conclusion that we have come to, that indeed our God is an awesome God. The psalmist in Psalm 19 said this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. God in his creative act reveals himself. The heavens declare... You see, when you look at the world around you, it should be telling you something about God. If it is not, and I don't mean to sound harsh or abrasive in any way at all, but if it's not, then you're missing something. There's that age-old saying that perhaps is cliche and yet nonetheless is true. It behooves us from time to time to stop and smell the roses. But more than that, It benefits us to consider, where did this come from? We're going to look at three different things this morning, three very basic things. And we're going to ask that question, what do these teach me about God? Three different aspects of creation. What do these aspects of creation teach us about our great and awesome God? Now, all you're really going to have to do is read those scriptures when we get to them. Everything that's going to be on the board is just a picture to encourage you to think about the beauty of God. Number one, if we want to find out about the vastness of God, the enormity of God, the awesomeness of God, the greatness of God, all we have to do is look to the heavens, look to the sky, and consider His great and mighty works. Let's, let's begin with the sun. Our our sun, that thing that rises, and sometimes we wish it were a little hotter on mornings like this morning, right? Not really, though. It's just an incandescent mass of gas. It's just a, a gigantic furnace that produces such heat that on the surface of the sun, things that you and I would never think of as anything other than solid are actually gas. Iron, aluminum, you know the car that you drove here this morning? Everything down to that engine block made of that metal on the surface of the sun is a gas. It burns that hot. Now our sun sits about 92 million miles, a little bit more than that, almost 93 million miles, away from us. The light from the sun takes about eight minutes to get to us. So every time you go outside and you see that sun and you feel its rays, those rays are about eight minutes old. But on the other hand, the same rays that we see pass right by us And it takes them, traveling at about 670 million miles per hour, give or take, takes them four and a half years to get to the nearest star that you can see in the heavens. That's how vast our solar system is, our galaxy is, our universe. 
is. And the sun that we see every day, it too is a star, and yet it's only a medium-sized star. There are stars that are far bigger than the actual star that we have as our sun. You have stars like Betelgeuse and Sirius and all of them make our sun look like a dwarf. And yet our sun has a diameter that is a hundred times larger than the world that we live on. The sun itself is an amazing thing. But let's consider the planets for just a minute. There are two types of planets in our solar system. Our solar system has terrestrial planets, planets that are made primarily of earth or some kind of rock or material. But then there are the gaseous giants. The gaseous giants, as you might expect, are primarily made of gas. And these two types of planets are separated by this asteroid belt. And all of these planets and asteroid belt in our solar system are kind of moving around the sun at their own pace, and at the same time, they are in the midst of their own revela- rev- revolutions as the whole thing sort of hurls through space at breakneck speeds. And yet it's all held together, and none of it breaks apart. As a matter of fact, scientists, guys who have the know-how and the ability to do so, can predict about how all of those pieces working together are going to make certain things happen. And mankind has progressed to the point to where we can actually send probes out into that space at least a certain distance and explore what you and I can only see while standing on the surface of this earth. But speaking of our earth... Earth is an amazing thing. Earth is in our solar system in a small band that varies by only about two or three degrees that even scientists will tell you is called the Goldilocks zone. Now, everybody remembers Goldilocks, right? Goldilocks is that little girl who, you know, one bed was too soft, one bed was too hard, one was just right. Well, we live in that just right band that goes around our sun in order to be able to have a planet that is able to sustain life. You see, if we were any closer to the sun, we would burn up with fervent heat, right? If we were any further from our sun, we would freeze. You think it's cold on mornings like this one? Move us a couple degrees away from the sun, and then you're talking about real cold. But on planet Earth itself, there are amazing features. Our planet is made up of about four different layers. You have an inner core, an outer core, you have a mantle, and then you have a crust. The crust is about 35 miles deep. And we've yet to probe, but just a small portion of that. If the earth were an apple, the crust would be about the thickness of the skin. And we've not even penetrated through that skin. That's how little we've explored. There are literally places on this earth that mankind cannot go. For 10,000 plus years of history of men living on this planet, there have been places that we have been unable to go. Now, many of them are under the surface of the water and certainly not fit to live in. And yet, even there, we find God's life teeming. Any time that we perchance have the ability to some way probe into those depths. See, the crust of the earth sits on top of this mantle, which is liquid rock and metal. And it's a series of plates, and as those plates collide, and they subduct and induct and all of those different types of things, and science will tell you, it forms places like the Rocky Mountains, and the Andes, and the Sierra Nevadas, the Hawaiian Islands, volcanic activity, the Ring of Fire, and those wonderful things that make our world a a beautiful place, an amazing place, a sometimes dangerous place. But we, as far as we know, are the only place in which there is an atmosphere that we are able to breathe. And the 
atmosphere that we have on Earth is a perfect mixture of oxygen and other gases that allow life to be sustained. Increase or decrease the percentages of any of the given gases, including oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen, and you have a mix that is unsuitable for human consumption. And yet, somehow, life exists. So we have this giant universe and galaxy and solar system all revolving around one another. And here on this little place called Earth, we stand floating on our plates, upheld by the great and wonderful power of, of God. But go out even further into the solar system, and what you find is further amazing. See, those great gas giants that sit out beyond that asteroid belt, and the asteroid belt itself has a wonderful function. As everything spins and moves in its own unique way, it protects the Earth from that stray asteroids and things of that nature as they enter into our solar system and would threaten the, the Earth. People often talk about exploring other planets for, for life. It's probably not a good idea. Those planets differ in, in many ways from the Earth that we live on. For instance, Neptune is the coldest place on, in our solar system. If you were to go to Neptune, sometimes you think Florida's hot. If you're looking for that really cold place, you can go to Neptune. Live there. Negative 236 degrees. Average temperature. Average temperature. Now, if you want the hottest place, maybe it's not warm enough for you and you need the hottest place, well, Venus holds that record. Because Venus <clears throat> has these gases that surround the planet, it holds in all of the heat. And the average surface temperature of Venus is about 475 degrees. I don't know about you, but that's reminiscent of when I cooked that turkey back in November. That's not living temperature. Uranus is a unique planet, not only because of the name and kids chuckling at it, but because it alone has a rotation that's unlike any other planet. You see, the Earth tilts on its axis and it spins this way as it rotates around the sun. Uranus, like a bowling ball, sits on an axis that goes this way and it literally bowls its way around the sun. And scientists still speculate as to exactly why that is. One thing they do know is that on Uranus, winter, now if you like winter, this is the place for you. Winter on Uranus lasts about 21 years. 21 years. But don't get too used to it because summer also lasts about 21 years on Uranus. And we could go on and on and you could talk about the stars and you could talk about how all of these things fit together but the thing that's always impressed me and the thing that the psalmist reminds us of the heavens declare the glory of God is that every single little piece of this whether we understand it or not why does Uranus spin that way why is it so hot here why is it so cold here What's this whole equinox and solstice and these rotations and ellipses? Oh, what's all that about? Whether we understand that or not, we can look at it, we can see it move, we know it works, and it's all upheld by the power of God. Now, if you don't think that's impressive, <clears throat> try it sometime. See, most of us know we can't do anything that approaches that. I mean, I can't even get uh, Alexa and Siri and Bixby and Cortana and all. I can't even get them to listen to me. Let alone command planets and tell them to be here and do this. And move in this direction or that direction. I can't do that. See, God is in control of it all. And it's vast. It just tells us how great our God is. And we've not even left our solar system. 
Greater technology has allowed us to see further into space, beyond our own solar system. And truly, as the Bible has said, the stars in the heavens are beyond counting. It is that vast. And yet at the same time, while God is controlling all that vastness, he looks down upon you and cares for you. He looks down upon this world and he's made it for you so that you might live, so that you can know what it means, so that you can understand that God not only in the beginning created, but that in the beginning that creation was built upon his love. It's an amazing thing to consider our world. These are just a few pictures of some of the things that you can experience. This isn't even leaving the country. Number two, to see his sovereignty, look to the beasts of the field. If you would, go over to the book of Job. Go over to the book of Job. <clears throat> In the book of Job, of course, Job is a book that deals with, with many things. We could easily go over to Ecclesiastes or some other psalm where the psalmist or certainly the wise man Solomon tells us that, you know, if you want to gain wisdom, you can go to the animals. You can go to the spider. You can go to the lizard. You can go to the badger and gain from them wisdom. If you want to know the sovereignty of God, look to the beasts as, his cre uh, as part of his creation. Job 12, verse 7. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? The hand of the Lord there is just simply a depiction of God acting and controlling. In other words, God is sovereign. If you're not familiar with that word, if it's one of those big words that you don't quite understand, it just means that God is in control. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. And you can see this in the, in the animals and the plants and the things around us each and every day. You know, one of the things that I've always found most impressive are migrations. Migrations. You ever read or see? You can go to Netflix and you can watch videos there about the great migrations of, of the world. We actually have one that goes by near here. Uh, the, the rays migrating through the Gulf. It's a pretty amazing thing when you watch the videos. When we were in Texas and we lived in Texas, there, the, we experienced the, the migration of the, the monarch butterflies. There are birds that will travel to places all over the world every year. Go back to the same building or hill or hollow or tree thousands of miles away from where they were. The plover is, is one of those. Without any kind of GPS, without anybody at a roadside gas station telling them, hey, yeah, it's on down that way and turn left and all of that, it flies about 4,000 miles across water, having eaten for months to double its body size, just to get back to the place where those birds breed. Every year, the buzzards return to Hinkley, Ohio, the sparrows to Capistrano, and on and on you could go. How do these animals know how to do that? Why do the monarchs fly to Mexico? Why do the buzzards come to Hinkley? I'm sure the people in Hinkley are probably still trying to figure that out. Why do these animals travel all over the world every time? Why do the salmon swim upstream? Now, you know, not all salmon do that, right? There are different types of salmon, and some remain in fresh water, some go from the fresh water out to sea only to return again. And others have different variations of that routine. But the thing that they all have in common is that they make a migration 
that with pinpoint accuracy places them at exactly the place that they were brought into this world. That little bitty egg that's laid in that little piece of sand there in that little river somewhere up near Alaska. will go downstream as an adult only to later on come back to that same piece of sand and once more begin the process all over. There are amazing creatures in our world. You know there's a snail <clears throat> that can sleep for three years. Sleep for three years. You thought you slept a long time? Right? You think your spouse maybe sleeps for, like, get up. There's a snail that sleeps for three years. The average ostrich, you know, its eye is actually bigger than its brain. Well, you know, I guess that's not saying too much. But, you know, ostriches are, are, are amazing creatures. And there are a lot of amazing creatures. Someone sent me an email that contained this about birds, and I, I thought this was fascinating. It says, one may observe God's accuracy and control in the hatching of eggs. Those of the canary, 14 days. Those of the barnyard hen, 21 days. Eggs of a duck and a geese, 28 days. Those of a mallard in 35 days. Eggs of a parrot and an ostrich hatch in 42 days. In 42 days. And if you paid attention, and you are that math-inclined kind of person you realize that every single one of those terms, every single one of those numbers that was given to you is divisible by seven. Divisible by seven. Now, I don't want to make things more than they are, but seven is one of those numbers in the Bible that is a number of perfection. It is the number that is most closely associated with God and his interaction because it is perfect. It is perfect. The article goes on to say, We see God's wisdom in the making of the elephant. The four legs of the great beast all bend forward in the same direction. No other quadruped is so made. God planned that this animal would have a huge body, too large to live on two legs. For this reason, he gave it four fulcrums, so that it can rise from the ground easily. The horse rises first on its front two legs. The cow rises first on its back two legs. The elephant, all four, because God is wise and God is in control. Not only that, he knows what he's doing. We can sit around and we can guess why. We can look at the world around us and scratch our heads. But at the end of the day, you got to know somebody's in control. That somebody is God. And the Bible reveals to us who he is. I want to read a couple more lines from this article just because I find it fascinating. Every watermelon has an even number of stripes on the rind. Each orange has an even number of segments. Each ear of corn has an even number of rows. Each stalk of wheat has an even number of grains. Every branch of bananas has on its lowest row an even number of bananas and each row decreases by one so that one row has an even number and the next row has an odd number every one whether there are storms or whether it's calm waves come into the beach at a rate of 26 per minute 26 per minute whether it's observable by our eye or not All grains are found in even numbers on the stalk. God has caused certain flowers to blossom so that botanists in a dark room or dark, uh, you know, conservatory, not being able to see the outside, would be able to tell by the blooming of the flowers what time of day it is. There are that many and they are so regular in their blooming that not only could they tell the time of day, but they could tell the temperature because each requires something slightly different. Look at the world around you. It is constantly declaring to you, God is in control. 
He is the one who made this vastness. He is the one who is in control. He's not the one that put glasses on my dog. <clears throat> that was somebody else. But he is the one that is sovereign. Last point. To see his love, look to mankind. Go with me over to the book of Psalms one more time. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. <clears throat> And we're going to look at, uh, beginning with verse 11, we're going to read down through about verse 14. <clears throat> 139, beginning with 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall, come over, shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And he goes on to talk about it. And the more you read, the greater the picture of love becomes. You see, God didn't just in the beginning create us, and that creation was kind of sterile and lifeless without feeling and emotionless. Instead, we are told about a creation that is beautiful and wondering and infused with love and amazement, because that is our God. And everything that He creates... He has built upon love. The part of your body that grows the quickest until you're about five years old is your brain. Do you know that your eyes are the same size today as they were the day you were born? But your nose and your ears will continue to grow for the rest of your life. You have big ears? Sorry, they're only going to get bigger. You got a big nose? Sorry, it's only going to get bigger. That's the way God has made us. The average human being has over 100,000 hairs on their head. And God says that he knows them all. Now, some of you obviously have less. That's okay. We don't think less of you. God still loves you. He knows how many hairs you could have. Uh, but don't. Right? Your skull is made up of about 29 different bones, put together kind of like a, a puzzle. Those lines that divide each piece being called sutures. And they are born with kind of a cartilage in between, and those bones get harder as we grow, as the body gets bigger. And our brain that grows more than anything else in our body grows in size. That skull that today is kind of hard gets bigger. Truly, the human body is an amazing thing. The entire length of all of the eyelashes shed by human beings in their lifetime. If you were to take all of your eyelashes, why you would ever do this, I don't know. But if you were to take all of the eyelashes that you have shed and grown during the course of the average length life, and line them up end to end, they would measure about 98 feet in length. Now, in perspective, from here to that back wall is maybe 60 feet. So you're talking the length of this building. That's your eyelashes. Okay? How do we know that? I mean, you've got to wonder who took the time to count this, right? But see, that's hair. God has all of that figured out as well. That, since we're talking about hair, do you know that your nails, your nails are made of the same substance that your hair is made up, made up of? The average human being will shed about 40 pounds of skin. Most of that will go into your couch. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know anything about that. But the average couch weighs about 10 pounds more by the time you throw it away because of the oils in the shed skin from the bodies of the people who sit on it. But if you want to know about God's love, just look in the mirror. Truly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made to experience 
this world around us. Our God, indeed, is a vast and awesome God who has control of everything. And the basis of that control, the glue of that control, the amazing thing about that control is that it's driven by the love of God. Now, I love this, this picture of Brother Keith. He may not like it. He's kind of covered in dirt there, and if you could see it close up, his head's all covered with sweat. But that's love. This is a picture of work in Marathon Key. He went down there and pulled out ceilings and carried trash and sweat and sweat some more. And then when we thought we couldn't sweat anymore, we, we sweat some more. That's love. The work at Wikiwachi, that's, that's love. Furman and the boys and the rest of the team in Mexico building homes, that's love. It's the same love that God shows in the world around us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. I like verse 16, and I'm going to close with it. Verse 16 of Psalm 139 says, <clears throat> Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God knows the entirety of your life. God knows you. He formed you. He made you. He loves you. Now, what will you do about that? Can we honestly stand in the presence of God living in his created world, knowing his love for us, and simply go about our business, eh, unimpressed? Then I would dare say we're not thinking about it hard enough. If you're here this morning, however, and you know it's time to act, just simply ask, have you heard his word? You see, faith, that thing that God requires, for without it it is impossible to please God, that conviction that God requires is a must. And it comes by hearing his word, according to Paul in Romans. Do you have that faith? Having heard that word? Has it led you to change your mind about how you think, about sin, about this world, about this life? Maybe you're here this morning, you're convicted, and you just need to know what to do. Confess the name of Christ, be baptized, rise from those waters to walk in newness of life. If you're ready to take that step today, let it be known. If there's some other step you need to take, maybe you need prayers, maybe you need help, maybe you just need somebody to talk to. If you're here this morning and you need anything, let your need be known while together we stand and sing.